Welcome to Statistically Insignificant, my little self-indulgence about statistics with slides. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be the stats nerd today. As the unpaid and much abused test subject from my teaching methods, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? Um, my pronouns are he and him, and since the last episode, I've gone on a dogfighting propeller plane adventure to find the treasure that will end the war. Or I think maybe I entered a fugue state while I was watching anime. <laughs> Which war, though? <laughs> the war between the two nations. Oh, just two. <laughs> Oof, that's a real yeah. one. <laughs> so this episode is about the much maligned p-values, the first of two on the topic. In this episode, we're going to talk about what p-values are and how they get used for hypothesis testing. Next time, we're going to talk about p-hacking and the structures in academia which encourage it. If you've not heard of p-values, they're a statistical tool that is used to make decisions about hypotheses, more or less. They have been used for a long time, and they're usually used to say either, yes, we think something is happening, or no, we think it isn't. So they, they are primarily used as a tool of binary decision making. But, as I'm going to argue, that's probably not the best use for them. P-values are primarily a construction from frequentist statistics. If we think back to episode 8, when we talked about frequentist and Bayesian frameworks for inference. There is a similar construction in Bayesian statistics, which is much more straightforward, but p-values are more widely used, so that's what we're going to look at. They're also used a lot in the decision-making, which is how they come to affect the lives of people who don't directly work with them. An awful lot of medical decisions, whether to approve drugs or other treatments, for example, is based on p-value calculations. A p-value is a number between 0 and 1. 1, somewhere in that range, could be 0, could be 1, probably isn't gonna, that represents a probability in the context of a hypothesis test. They only have a definition in the context of the null hypothesis, which, thinking back to episode 8 again, is the kind of privileged hypothesis that says, oh, actually nothing's going on, this treatment doesn't work, there was no effect, the person does not have the disease if you're testing for COVID or something like that. We're going to walk through the construction of p-values in that context with a particular example. To build a p-value, you ask what the world would look like if the null hypothesis is true. Specifically, we want to know what sort of statistics we would observe on a sample that we take from some population in this situation. This is very basic, but the hypothesis is H0. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is notation. Yeah, cool. The constraint on hypotheses here is that they really need to be stated with regards to something we can measure. Usually the sorts of summary statistics we talked about back in episode 7, I think? Don't quote me on that. Go look at the back log, it'll be there somewhere. For <laughs> our example, imagine we are interested in the mean of a population. The same construction applies to other things, including the COVID tests we talked about. Our mean might be the size of a species, mean temperature, mean number of weed plants per household, whatever. The most basic setup is your null hypothesis, H0, says the mean number, mean value is whatever, like 5, 10, 100. Pick a number in the context of the question you're asking, right? Your alternative hypothesis, this is the status quo, frequently the mean zero, if you're looking at something like an effective change or whatever is what you would take there. Your alternative hypothesis is kind of the effect you're really interested in. So in this context, we're going to say it is the mean is not whatever we've got here. This is a two-sided test because the way we'd actually write this up here is mean equal to something, right? Whereas this would be mean not equal to something, as opposed to mean greater than or mean less than, which is a one-sided test. You can think about this on the number line. If we have our mean value here, this is our proposed mean under H0, the two-sided hypothesis can be either to that side or that side, whereas the one-sided hypothesis would just be the one, right? Right. Because I can't measure the whole population, if we could, we wouldn't need to do this in the first place, we take a random sample, some smaller group of individuals or objects, measure the statistic on that, and attempt to infer something about the whole lot. So we take a random sample, which is a smaller part of the whole population, and you measure stuff on it. 
So you're looking for deviations from the null hypothesis within that group? Yes. Because this sample is smaller than the whole population, because we don't measure everything, we're very unlikely to get the true, in quotation marks, population value. So if you imagine measuring the uh, population mean of the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, you add them up, you divide by 4, and you get a mean of 2.5, right? Assuming all of them are equally likely, which is a reasonable assumption to make if you're doing this in a population. Now, if you only sample two of these, let's say you sample one and two, your mean here, your sample mean, because it's measured in a sample, will be 1.5, right? This is not equal to 2.5. We have to be aware of this deviation from the true population mean that you observe in a sample because you've randomly sampled it, right? And this is why we use statistics to say, okay, we, what we sampled is not going to be the same as the true population mean, but is it different enough from what we expect to see? So how would you come to what you expect to see? Like how would you come to your non null hypothesis when taking it to the sample? Well, it depends on what you're trying to test. Like if, if I am, for example, saying, hey, I have this great new fertilizer that will boost your crop yield, how I show evidence of that is I have a whole bunch of control crops which don't get my fancy new fertilizer, I have some uh, treatment crops which do, and then I compare the yield from those. Yeah. Uh, if I am, so in that case you've got a bit more of a controlled environment that you have a control group and a test group. Uh, if I'm just like going out into the wild and saying, oh I want to measure something, let's have a look at this population of, tr of trees in a particular valley and I want to know if there's evidence that they differ in their growth rate from the population of trees somewhere else, then if I know something about the population of trees in that other place, like the mean growth rate, I can then compare what I observe in this particular valley to that and ask, is there a measurable difference? Right. Yeah. So it is one of the reasons that I'm being extremely vague with all of this is because the precise hypotheses that you test are so context and problem dependent. Yeah. The uh, kind of requirement on this and the constraint here is that you have this null and alternative hypothesis set up. This has shortcomings. We did discuss them a little bit when we talked about uh, frequentist versus Bayesian methods of inference, but it's pretty good for most of the sorts of binary decision makings, like am I going to approve this COVID drug or COVID vaccine or whatever. So if we think about sampling from this distribution of four, right, we see we can get 1.5. But there are actually six different possible uh, samples we can see. We can get 1 and 2, which gives us 1.5. We can get 1 and 3, which gives us 2. 1 and 4, which gives us a mean of 2.5. 2 and 3, which is another mean of 2.5. 2 and 4, which is a mean of 3. And 3 and 4, which is a mean of 3.5. Each of these samples here is equally likely to occur because each of the individual values is equally likely. So we can explicitly work out a probability distribution on these values here, the sample mean, yeah. using that assumption, which is that each of these here are equally likely to be observed. So what that actually looks like is that if we have our mean, which was 1.52, 2.5, 3.5, 0.5, then our probability of observing them, well, only one of the samples had 1.5, so that's 1 on 6. One of them had 2.5. Two of, sorry, one of them had 2. Two of them had 2.5, so that can be 2 on 6, which is a third, then 1 on 6, and 1 on 6. Notice that the true population mean 2.5 is the most likely thing to observe but still only represents a third of the possible samples that you could make. Two thirds of the yeah. time, you'd observe something else. If our null hypothesis is that the mean of the population is 2.5, so H0 pop mean equal to 2.5, then this is the actual probability distribution of the sample mean. And we can say, okay, 
what's unlikely to be seen in this, what is sufficiently unlikely to be seen, that we would expect it to be evidence against that being the true population mean. So this is also the distribution we would use to construct a p-value. The fundamental idea here is that a probabilistic sample, or something which can be approximated probabilistically, see our bonus episode on chaos and randomness for more on that, transfers a probability distribution to the sample statistic. We consider what that would be for the population value proposed in the null hypothesis, the mean in this case, and we try to do some reasoning with that. I'm going to state some facts here which have mathematical justification that I won't be showing you. The distribution of the sample mean depends on the sample size, and in the case of the population mean, there are some really nice results which tell us that if your sample size is large enough, whatever that means, the distribution of the sample mean looks something like this. And it's centered at the true population mean. For the hardcore nerds following at home, this is a normal or Gaussian distribution, and the justification is known as the central limit theorem. How large the sample size needs to be to get convergence to this depends on the distribution of the population. If we have a given null hypothesis, then assuming the null hypothesis is true is equivalent to saying that we assume the distribution of the sample statistics is centered on the value it proposed. So this is the proposed value in your null hypothesis, right? We then take a sample, which will give us a value somewhere of a sample mean somewhere on this x-axis. So let's say we measured something here. What is considered enough evidence to reject this null hypothesis amounts to asking whether the sample mean we observed is unlikely enough in this distribution to lead us to think that something else is going on. The p-value is one way of doing this, a metric for how unlikely what we observed is. So why, why is it um, likely that on any given topic that the distribution pattern would be that clean? Or is it not? Can oh, it be... it's not. This is an approximation. So, oh, okay, cool. yeah, 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 so we use this approximation because it's straightforward. The, um, right. the central limit theorem and the, like, convergence based on the sample size is how we justify that approximation, more or less. Okay. There are settings in which it is more appropriate and others in which it is less. And there's a whole stack of statistical tests which are not based on this distribution, which you can use if you, what you get is not amenable to this. Right. Yeah, it's, it gets messy very, very fast. Uh, this is very much the cut-down version. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So I'm going to give you a technical definition here, and then because it's pretty much word silent, we're going to talk about it. So a p-value is the probability of observing a result, which means sample statistic, at least as extreme, we'll get to what that means, when the null hypothesis is true. Okay, as I said, word salad. Basically, we can go back to the diagram we had and talk about this a bit more. We opened the episode by saying that a p-value is a probability, and we have established that the null hypothesis being true means that this distribution is centered at the value of proposers. Approximately, we're just going to assume it's nice enough for now. At least as extreme, then, means at least as far from what we expect to see. Now we expect to see, in a mathematical sense, the population mean. At least as far, if this is what we observed as our sample mean, then is that far or further away, right, on this side. Now we had a two-sided hypothesis, right? If we come all the way back up to here. So we care about what's far away on the right as well as far away on the left. Yeah. So not only do we have to look at what's to the left of this, we take kind of the mirror of that on the other side of the population mean and look at what's to the right of it. What we have, because this is a probability distribution and in this context how we calculate probability is area under the curve. So the probability of being at least as extreme, we calculate that by looking at the area to the left of this value down here and the right of that value down there which is like this. So the p-value is the probability of being in these regions. And this gives us some p equal to some number between 0 and 1 representing the probability. Right. For completeness, if we have a one-sided test, we only look at one side of the observed value. So I'm going to need a couple more diagrams for this. 
So if we have our alternative hypothesis is that uh, the population mean uh, mean is less than some value and down here we're going to look at population mean greater than some value so less than the small end is on the light on the left greater than the small end is on the right what we look at here in the first case i can pretend i can draw so here is our proposed null hypothesis mean right and we observe something here then because our alternative hypothesis is looking at things smaller than the proposed value we look at what is to the left right it's just the left hand side of the distribution because you're looking at things smaller than what you observed yeah however and this traps people if they are using statistical software as a black box if you have the same observation but your null hypothesis is greater but your alternative hypothesis is looking at what's greater then even though you observe something over here the actual area that you integrate over what's considered more extreme is what's to the right of this which is all of this stuff in here right <laughs> and this is a real uh trap for people because a lot of statistics software assumes you know what you are doing and it's used by a lot of people who have not been exposed to enough paranoia about statistical software that that is a safe assumption to make. So <laughs> it's not uncommon to see people told that they can take a p-value calculated like this and directly transfer it to either of these by simply halving the p-value. Now that works fine <laughs> if you're on the right, if you're on the correct side of what you're looking at, right? So if if you're looking at something with this structure in the alternative hypothesis, so the population mean is smaller than your proposed value, and you measure something smaller than your proposed value, you're fine. You can halve that. If, on the other hand, you're in this situation, where what you're interested in in your alternative hypothesis is larger than what you observed, and you observe something smaller than your proposed value, you're in trouble. So it's like extreme in the 90s, in that it's everywhere and not actually accurate. <laughs> Exactly. Making this mistake would let you, like, to find evidence to support the fact that one is actually smaller than zero, for example. Which, uh, you can run into problems if you're trying to use maths like that. <laughs> there are a couple of things that a p-value is not, but that pop up all the time as misconceptions. Including in a Nature article I read for this, actually, which issued a correction along those lines. So we're going to say things... A p-value is not. First, p-values are not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. There's no probability involved in the true state of the null or alternative hypothesis. It's either true or not in the real world. For example, if you're doing a hypothesis test on a COVID test, right, then your, your person either has COVID or doesn't. The result of the test as a probabilistic statement is based on the fact that you don't know that. But the real, the true state of the null or alternative hypothesis is fixed. There's no probability involved there. Yeah. This is the misconception that was in the Nature article. This one is extremely common. It's particularly frustrating because it tells me that this person has not had somebody sit down and say, how does this hypothesis test relate to the real world? It, that's troubling. It's not surprising. I've seen what <laughs> statistics teaching is like in universities, uh, and frequently it's not that great, frankly. And also, I did a year of journalism school. You don't have to learn any science or anything. <laughs> yes. Number two. P-value being small means the alternative hypothesis is true. This is basically the same misconception as the first one, but in a slightly different structure. So in this context, p-value being small means that what you observed was unlikely to happen when the null hypothesis is true. But as we just mentioned, the status of the null or alternative hypotheses are not down to chance. There's a one is true and one is false in the way that they are constructed. This interpretation is problematic because it kind of undermines the whole structure of hypothesis testing. And third, a small p-value means that the resulting effect is large. What I mean by this is that 
just because something has a is unlikely to happen under the null hypothesis doesn't mean that it the what you observed was hugely different from what you would expect to see under the null hypothesis. So what that can look like is I could have a vaccine for, for COVID, for example, which has a measurable result in the sense that it is measurably effective. It reduces the incidence of disease among people who are vaccinated, but that might only be by five or 10%. So that is in comparison to something which is also measurable, but has an 80 or 90% effectiveness in its reduction of disease, right? Yeah. Both of those can have the same p-value, it's just that one has a much larger effect size than the other. And this is something that can be like particularly troublesome in psychology and material science, because you can detect changes in material science in particular that are very small, but they may not actually be worth investigating depending on like cost benefit analysis and all that sort of thing. Because a one percent difference may not be worth pursuing, but a 20% difference might. Our p-value is a metric for how much what we actually observed, the sample statistic, deviates from what we expect to see if the null hypothesis is true. This is much more general than the way they used in hypothesis testing, where we have to make a decision about whether we retain or reject the null hypothesis. So let's go back to our example here. So we had our null hypothesis, our mean is equal to some value, and our alternative hypothesis, mean is not equal to some value. Now, if we are doing a hypothesis test, as opposed to just quantifying evidence in a more wibbly wobbly way, we look at this and we say, okay, we're going to say the evidence supports one or the other of these. We retain or reject the null hypothesis in that context. In our episode on COVID testing, we also talked about the possible errors in hypothesis testing. So if we think back to this, there was a, a, a matrix, a table. Yep. Yep. So this is our um, positive test. This is what's in reality. Negative, positive, negative. If these agree, this is a true positive. If these agree, this is a true negative. If in reality you have a negative result, but your test says positive, this is a false positive. If in reality you have a positive result, but your test says negative, you have a false negative. Our p-value is constructed in the column where the null hypothesis is true, which is this one. This is a negative result, right? We consider the yeah. alternative hypothesis being true a positive result. In general, we care about false positives when we are doing this. We control the rate of the false positives and construct our test in a way where we hope to minimize the false negatives because you can't, the way that the um, testing itself is constructed, we don't really pay attention to false negatives. We just have to hope that the uh, sampling procedure was good enough, basically, which can include <laughs> things like you have enough people in your experiment. Yeah. So let's go back to our distribution of the mean. So if we assume the null hypothesis is true, we get something that looks more or less like this. If we reject the null hypothesis, if we see something sufficiently unlikely, that's our threshold for making that decision, which means that we pick a region far enough away from the center to represent some probability of a false positive. So if we say, okay, from this end, that's sufficiently unlikely, we're gonna take the same thing on the other side. If I observe something in these regions, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis, is how I think about this. Yep. We call this the region of rejection, which is not in fact what I call my DMs. If we observe a sample statistic here, we consider that evidence to reject the null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is true, there's still a probability of fall in the, falling in these regions, right? Yeah. Specifically, this is the probability of observing a false positive. And it's usually written, written with the Greek letter alpha. Yeah. Theoretically, you should set this probability before you make any observations as the risk you're willing to take of a false positive. We don't know if a positive result is true or false because we don't get access to that information. But if it is a false positive, it's also known as a spurious result. You may have seen this come up in discussions about science and problems in science related p-values. We can connect our p-value to this quite directly. Remember, the p-value is the probability of being further away from what you expect to see. 
So if we observe a sample mean, I'm going to draw this in another color. Let's say over here, right? This is what I sample mean. Yep. Then the pro then the p value, the probability of being more extreme, is this bit over here, and on the other side, this bit over here. Yep. Now the bit highlighted in black is smaller than the bit highlighted in red. So that would be a smaller area, which means your p value would be smaller than alpha, where alpha would be the area of the region in red. Yep. It means you've taken the sample in a in a position below the threshold of... Uh, well, within the region risk. of rejection, yeah. Yeah. This gives us our, like, general rule that we use to do hypothesis testing with p-values, which is p is low, which means p smaller than alpha, reject HO, reject the null hypothesis. You calculate the p-value. If it's smaller than alpha you have a positive result and you reject that null hypothesis. I'm going to draw a new situation here. Imagine instead uh, our region of rejection is going to be this red bit. So imagine instead we've observed something that's not in the region of rejection. So we've observed something here. Yep. Then when we go to calculate our p-value, it's going to be all of this area plus all of this area because it's a two-sided test. In this case, yeah. P is bigger than alpha, so we would not reject the null hypothesis. In this case, it is not sufficiently unlikely what we observed if the null hypothesis is true, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and the result is not what we call statistically significant. So this is where we get a significant versus a non-significant result, or insignificant, if you want to know the origin of the really stupid joke that's the title of this podcast. In practice, if P is close to alpha, we consider the result borderline. So it's not necessarily black and white, but I really should put greater than or equal to alpha there. And this is fail to reject the null hypothesis. The problems arise with choosing alpha. I said that we should set this before we do the analysis so that we can't be accused of choosing it after the fact in order to suit the results. We also use approximations and expect things like measurement error, so the p we calculate is really only an estimate of the quote-unquote true p-value. So our binary decision, retain or reject the null hypothesis, becomes a matter of a chosen alpha, which is a matter of what the research culture considers sufficient evidence. This is not mathematical formalism. This is a social construction. It's a bit of a problem in that context. So common p-values are 0 0.05, which gives us a 1 in 20 chance of a false positive, when the null hypothesis is true, anyway. Uh, 0 0.01, which is 1 in 100, or 1%. Uh, 0 0.001, and so on. Yeah. These represent our biases for multiples of 10. Why not 0 0.02, for example? Why not 0 0.015? Yeah, so all of this is very much culturally constructed. And thank God for that, because I've got some cigarettes to sell to children. <laughs> right. And that that's an issue that is not particularly well addressed. And I have seen some, let's call them ranting stem bros on the internet talking about science who think that it is in any way absolute. And in the, in the context of this, they say, oh, it's not socially determined. It fucking is. Like, so much about even, even what you test is socially determined. How you test it, something like this, is also socially determined. Stem bros get out, right? There are more ways than just p-values of making a decision using this framework, which is broadly called null hypothesis significance testing. For a given significance threshold alpha, all of the different ways of doing this give you an equivalent decision. So what you choose mostly depends on what is the easiest thing for you to calculate and the most familiar. The region of rejection is actually one of these. So if we think about these, like the regions that we highlighted in red, right? So out here and out here, yeah? Yep. We call that the region of rejection because if we observed a sample statistic in those areas, that would lead us to reject the null hypothesis. That can be done without ever calculating a p-value. It's not the only way, there are a bunch of others. But frequently what we will do is instead of explicitly calculating a region of rejection because it's inconvenient to have to do that, we just have the computer give us a p-value instead. Both of them are equivalent, as we demonstrated with these red and black uh, areas. So this is where 
stats meets decision making, right? This binary choice, reject or retain the null hypothesis based on a socially chosen threshold of alpha. If you are being asked to approve or not a new drug to treat near-death COVID patients, you have a binary decision to make and you have to choose a threshold. This is a very different situation to people hypothesizing about the existence of the Higgs boson in data from the Large Hydrogen Collider or whatever, where you can be a little bit more theoretical about the possible explanations. There are decisions that have to be made that have a very direct impact on life and death. Unfortunately, there isn't an easy way out of the fact that the alpha threshold is a cultural construction. In the next episode, we're going to talk at length about how this P versus alpha construction leads to pathologies in the form of P hacking. For now though, I want to reiterate that P values are far more general than their use in binary decision makings. They really are a metric of how much your observed data deviates from the population that the null hypothesis describes. That's quite powerful when it's right as a descriptive tool. It's just not so useful to the people who have to make a binary decision based on evidence. I was just going to ask how alpha is actually calculated. So usually what you do is you pick a threshold of uh, false negatives that you would accept. So you pick the number yeah. and then from that you work out what your region of rejection is. Okay. Yeah, because if I think, so if I take my distribution here and I say, okay, I'm going to have uh, alpha equals 0 0.05, right? Yeah. I will then say, all right, I'm going to split that in two because it's two-sided. So I get 0 0.025 in each end. Then I need to work out what value along here would give me 0 0.025 in there. Yep. And then, you know, what value along here is 0. Whoops. Two five there. This is one of the reasons why a p value is often easier to get a computer to do than to determine these thresholds on your region of rejection. Right. Yeah. If you if you have a p value, you don't have to do this whole calculation thing. You only have to do a calculation using your sample statistic that transforms it into a p value, which is somewhat more straightforward. Usually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that that incentivizes the use of p values within the. Yes. Um, there are, so one of the other tools that I haven't introduced, and I'm sure we will talk about them at some other point, is what's called a confidence interval, which is some interval uh, around the measured sample statistics. So the population, the sample mean, for example, which you can think of as a, a range of plausible values for your population mean based on what you observed in the sample. Yeah. What, how you do a, a hypothesis test with that is you say, is my hypothesized value in the confidence interval or not? And it has exactly the same um, alpha structure, so exactly the same construction with this uh, probability of a false positive and all the rest of that. That decision, well, that observation, I guess, is my null hypothesis value in my confidence interval is separate to what are the plausible values based on my sample statistic, which is what the confidence interval actually tells you. Yes, okay. Yeah, so you get more information from a confidence interval in terms of what's the plausible value, whereas a p-value is much more of a direct comparison between what you observed and what you expected to see. Right. They kind of get used in different ways, and um, one of the major issues in the research literature with respect to statistics is what do you report? Like, what, what actual statistics do you tell the audience? And... It's notoriously bad. Uh, it depends on what field you're in as to how bad it is, but a lot of the time you won't get any of that information. You will just be told the result was statistically significant. You have to infer not only what the actual hypotheses were a lot of the time because they're not explicitly stated, you also have to infer what alpha was, usually 0.05, and you get no information on the actual p-value or the value of the like impact. That's right. very bad. <laughs> Other places you will be expected to report the observed sample statistic, so your sample mean or whatever else you were doing, the p-value and a confidence interval. That's reasonably sound. You may or may not be expected to actually explicitly state what hypotheses you're testing. I don't always agree with this, but in the context of 
particular math uh, particular mathematical models for things. There are just a list of standard hypotheses that you do, and you need to know those in order to interpret the results. But I would argue that you kind of need to know those in order to understand what the what the uh, model is doing anyway. So that I kind of understand. Yeah. In general, though, the fact that people don't tell you what the hypotheses are is a problem. The fact that papers get published that use this null hypothesis significance testing that don't tell you the p-value, that don't tell you the effect size, that don't tell you the confidence interval, and that don't tell you what alpha threshold they used, that's just the pits. Like, that gives you no information <laughs> realistically, and it's not necessarily difficult if you write a paper unscrupulously, let's say, to actually do all your hypothesis testing at alpha equals 0 0.1. So uh, easier, for, easier in quotation marks, you're more likely to see a, um, to reject the null hypothesis, yeah. even when it's true in this context, than if alpha equals 0 0.05. So you don't, if you don't publish any of that information, there's fewer checks on the research that you are doing. And I think some of that is because the people who do this treat statistics packages as a black box. They shove their data into it. They say, calculate me a p-value. They report on the p-value. And they don't understand any of the underlying statistical constructions that go into it. But it's not just lack of understanding, right? In a lot of cases, there would be a financial incentive in finding deviation from the... Um Oh boy, we will get to that. I mean, the next episode about p-hacking, oh, it's going to be some material analysis, baby. We're going there. <laughs> Hell yeah. So we're not going to do a mailbag for this episode because it's a two-parter and we're recording them back-to-back. -back. I'm exhausted enough and my brain is a mess. Instead, you should hop on over to our Patreon and check out the episodes there. Our third bonus is actually all about bullshit statistics, which was put out in January and does have a relationship to this material. But thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you in about five minutes, I guess. <laughs>